Modifiers are at the core of every 3D application's strength, including Maya, 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, and Blender. Knowing how to use them is not just important, but crucial for a 3D artist. If you master them, your journey will become a smooth walk. So today, let's talk about some Blender modifier tips and tricks you should know about. Starting with the bevel modifier, it's a great way to eliminate sharp, unnatural edges on a mesh. However, have you ever noticed that sometimes the bevel value only works up to a certain point? This happens because when the bevel is too large, the created edges may overlap or slide over the original edges, causing artifacts. Consequently, the bevel value is disabled or clamped when the modifier detects edges that are about to intersect. You can turn off this setting by going to the Geometry tab and switching off Clamp Overlap. Doing so will allow overlapping edges, which can help you identify areas where edges are too close and may become problematic when the bevel amount is increased. Once identified, you can either edit those edges or use a different limit method, such as bevel weight, to manually set the bevel amount for each edge. The other modifier that used to confuse me was the Simple Deform modifier. This modifier can do things like twist, bend, taper, and stretch geometry. It was always difficult to find the correct axis to use, but it's simple. The modifier will bend or twist the geometry around the axis you select. For example, it will twist around X if you select X, around Y if you select Y, and around Z if you select Z. The confusion arises when the object is rotated. It's easy to mix up these axes because the modifier works in the object's local coordinates, while the gizmo or move tool is usually in global coordinates, so, so the axes may not line up. You might select X, but the modifier will bend along Y. To simplify this, change the transform orientation to local so that everything matches. Now, when you switch the axis, the bend or twist should correspond with your expectations. If you want to use a different object's coordinates, such as an empty, just remember that the modifier will then work in the empty's local coordinates. With one key difference, the bend will always be around the X axis, or the axis selected in the modifier. Another one that took me a while to understand was the curve modifier. Here are the rules. Always start by moving the object to the same position as the curve. The easiest way to do that is by moving the 3D cursor to the curve's position. Select the curve and use Shift-S, then choose Cursor to Selected. Next, select the object and use Shift-S, then Selection to Cursor. You should also clear the rotation of both the curve and the object to ensure the coordinates align at the beginning. You can change the rotation later, but it will be confusing if they do not match initially. Additionally, to move the object along the curve, make sure you are in global orientation. Otherwise, you might move the x-axis thinking you are moving the y-axis. When you move the deformation axis, the object will always move along the curve, and depending on the deformation axis you choose, other axes may cause the object to move toward its center or up and down. The next one is the Surface Deform modifier. This modifier is straightforward. It uses one mesh to deform another. For example, you might have a chain mesh, which normally has a complicated geometry that makes running a cloth simulation challenging, and you want it deformed by a simple subdivided mesh. All you need is to have both meshes overlaid on top of each other. Then, add the modifier to the mesh you want to deform, and bind it to the deformer mesh. I like to change the display of the deformer mesh to wireframe so that it's easy to see through. Now, you can deform the deformer mesh as much as you want and your main mesh will try to match it. One thing to note though is that the poly count between the two meshes must always be the same. When you add or delete anything, the bond will break and the modifier will give you an error. It's easy to fix, simply unbind and bind again. Just a reminder, make sure the two meshes are close together. Otherwise, they won't bind as expected. Before we go any further, as much as I love Blender, the hard pill to swallow is that it can't do everything. 
It's a program designed to allow artists to create everything by themselves, so it tries to be a master of everything. While it does most things well, many features don't receive the development I wish they did, such as the simulation system, procedural workflows, and other areas. Of course, there are hundreds of add-ons you can install, but they are not a permanent solution. In many cases, it becomes expensive because every time you want to do something Blender can't do, you have to buy a new add-on. So instead, why not try Houdini? It always seems like the final boss of any 3D artist's career. It's inescapable and can solve almost all your Blender-related issues. As a bonus, you'll become even more marketable as a 3D artist. If you're interested in learning Houdini, so that it becomes part of your workflow, then try out Top Channel One-on-One's course, a Houdini course for Blender artists. The course approaches Houdini from the perspective of a Blender artist, making it super easy for any Blender user to pick up. It makes Houdini feel like a reskinned version of Blender, albeit with more features and professional level usability. The course covers the basics such as creating node trees and simulations. It will also be continuously updated, much like his Master Geometry Nodes course, which still receiving updates. So expect even more content as you progress. If you're interested, there is a discount link in the description. One of the most underrated modifiers is the mirror modifier. It's simple in nature, but its power comes from its ability to bisect and flip geometry, as well as to layer multiple mirror modifiers one after another. To get the most out of it, you can use empties as the mirror objects. Their positions will serve as the center of symmetry for each modifier you add. When you move an empty, the center moves, and when you rotate it, the entire geometry rotates. This can cause geometry from one side of the mirror to cross over into the other. That's when you use the bisect feature to clip the overlapping geometry. You can also flip the effect of the mirror to reveal what is on the opposite side of the bisect. However, the true power comes when you start adding more mirror modifiers. You can create intricate, repeating detail using just this one modifier. The next modifier that can be confusing is the screw modifier. If you're wondering what you're looking at and what's going on, don't worry. Just select your geometry and move it away from the center or pivot point. The modifier screws the geometry using the pivot point as the center of the screw. You can also rotate the geometry so that it's not flat on the surface to achieve better results. In edit mode, you can duplicate the geometry and move the copies around to create different versions of the screw. If you rotate the geometry around the pivot point, the screw will also rotate, creating twisting lines like this. Another great modifier that is initially hard to grasp is the ocean modifier, but it's quite simple once you understand a few key points. First, Add a material that makes the ocean look like an ocean. A dark reflective material works well. To animate the ocean, you need to animate the time value. You can keyframe this value or use a driver expression like hashed frame to use the current frame as the time value. To slow down the waves, simply divide hatch frame by 10 or another value to control the speed. The scale parameter controls the height of the waves. Smaller scales create detailed, small waves, while larger scales produce more prominent waves. You can also adjust the behavior of the waves in the spectrum settings to achieve either small or large waves. If you want the waves to move in one direction, set the alignment value to one, then lower it slightly to introduce some variation. The direction parameter, measured in degrees, determines which way the waves will travel. Now let's talk about foam. To generate foam, type foam in the data layer and use an attribute node in your material to utilize it. You can use this data as a mask layer. I usually apply it as a factor between the principled shader and diffuse shader. There is a lot more you can do with this modifier, but these are the basics you need to understand. As you can see, Blender is quite a powerful tool with many hidden features. One of its most powerful systems is the geometry nodes modifier. We can't cover it here, but if you're interested, check out Top Channel One-on-One's Master Geometry Nodes course. This course takes a deep dive into geometry nodes, showing you how to set everything up, from the basics to advanced levels, so you can apply this modifier in motion graphics, visual effects, procedural creations, and more. It's a constantly updated course with quizzes and exercises, providing you with a vast range of skills to apply to real projects. Check it out in the description. There's a discount link.